Welcome back to another episode of Dance Talk Real and it's a podcast where we discuss all nuances concerning education and dance because the dance experience is an experience worth talking about. I'm your host, Truly B, joined by my awesome co-host, Daryl P, and our lovely guest today, Miss Marie. Welcome back, darling. Before we jump into today's topic, here is our quote of the day, and it is from He Wishes for the Cloths of Heaven by W.B. Yates. But I, being poor, have only my dreams. I have spread my dreams under your feet. Tread softly because you tread on my dreams. Ooh. Mm -hmm. I know, right? It's like, yes, word. All right. So today, we will be talking about perfectionism and mental health and dance. And this is a topic that Marie brought to me. So thank you, darling. We appreciate your contribution. Very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So um, let's just jump straight into it. Um, From the slides that you sent me, first, this idea of perfectionism. Um, And this definition says that perfectionism is a trait characterized by striving for absolute flawlessness accompanied by critical self-evaluation. Yes. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, so I guess I'll start by asking both of you, um, do you feel in particular with um, your dance careers that you have fallen into the trap of perfectionism? Mm. Mm. A great question. <laughs> yes. Yes. To a certain, well, yes, I would say to a certain degree in the sense that you have to be able to accomplish, and I'm getting nitty gritty, like within dance, if you cannot accomplish certain moves, certain steps, then that negates, that even negates you from being able to then strive for perfectionism, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, so I would say, yes, I'm, especially in the ballet world, I most definitely, definitely have. I would say when I got to college and it was, um, you know, I was taking more contemporary and modern classes that were about exploration of art and, and not just art, but how your body itself applies to that exploration. It was a lot less feeling of having to be perfect in what I was physically able to do. Um, so yes, my answer would be yes. Makes sense. Yeah, I would say um, in the beginning, for myself, yes, I think I definitely strived for that perfection um, because I think that I was surrounded by teachers who, maybe, I don't know. I, I think at, at certain points in my life, I was encounter, I encountered teachers that did want that perfection. And then again, you know, I think when you're talking about more modern and more uh, contemporary styles, you know, it's less about the perfection and more about the like emoting and um, like there's just certain little, certain uh, in, intricate steps and movements that like could really make and break make or break that that piece but it's not necessarily about like the perfection of the of the movement right um and then fast forward to after you know i've graduated and now i am am teaching I, i think i went into this whole like you know growing up in uh being in texas and you know seeing my like, very precision dance team drill team it was about the perfection it was about the steps it was about the simple the simple arm placement from you know the arm facing this way arm facing that way like that that was that was wrong you know and so i think that um i even went went to a place where like I was kind of demanding that perfection from my, from my students and in my choreography. Um, and then I, and then at some points in, in time that I kind of left that too, because I realized that, you know, in order to challenge students who especially were just starting to dance in high school, that, you know, where I was trying to get them from ninth grade to, to, 
12th grade, there's going to be some points where that perfection just isn't going to happen, right? Like there's just a lot of this in-between steps that they just aren't going to get uh, in time. So uh, yeah, I think that in my own, in my own upbringing, I think I've kind of struggled with both and even post, you know, being a student and now being an educator, I think I kind of go back and forth between, you know, really looking for that perfection and then being okay with the imperfections. Um, And I think I also agree with both of you that definitely coming into the field for me coming in late, um, I already kind of had those traits of perfectionism. And so coming because to came in late. Yes. And like from music, the way like the teachers I had, mm-hmm. that's how it, perfection was expected. And so I was already kind of in that um, headspace. And so coming in late, I think pushed me even more so because I'm like, I don't have time to make mistakes. Like mm-hmm. I don't have time to be wrong. Like I have to get it right now because I'm playing catch up but I also have to be on par. So um, I agree. And Daryl, that was going to be my next thing is how do you, like, do you see that kind of coming out in your teaching? And similar to you, I um, 100% push my students for perfection. (laughs) Like a hundred percent. I'd be like, "Mm, this is not good enough (laughs) because if the arm is here, I don't want here (laughs) like no put it where I said put it but it's also like trying to get to the place where I can also accept that it may not be perfect and that's okay Mm -hmm. but part of me is still like "Mm, but you should still kind of aim for it so I guess that would go into is it possible for perfection to not always I guess come with the negative connotations um like for example um this goes on further to say that perfectionism has been linked to depression anxiety anorexia bulimia and suicide dancers often suffer from these illnesses and there's sadly not enough help provided by the industry Mm. and I can say like a hundred percent there was um a few people, but there's one girl in particular, I remember from undergrad, that um, she was berated in ballet on a regular basis um, over her body. And skill-wise, she was great. Like, she could do everything. And when, when I tell you, she was already about yay big. So, uh, but she wasn't quote unquote perfect to the standards of that teacher. And we remember, like, she came back, like, from summer, and it was like, you could see, like, ribs, Mm. like, you could see skeletal structure. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was very much a, you know, as friends, some of us were like, okay, well, you know, is everything okay? Do you need to, like, talk like we're here for you we got you and I think she had been so beaten down by it that all she would ever say to us is oh well you know I just lost a little bit of weight you know it's not a lot I'm actually still working on it and we're like baby no (laughs) working on it from you gonna die and we legit don't want to witness that happen like but I I guess it's when you keep getting that ideal pushed onto you, if you're not able to step away from it, get yourself out of it or have people surrounding you who are able to counteract that negativity, then that's when you end up with all these cases. And I'm like, you know, that was something even in school, I could see a lot of dancers dealt with. Mm -hmm. And thankfully, after graduating, I didn't see it so much like with the teachers who I knew, the studios that I worked at. Um, 
I didn't really see that, but I know that it's still a thing that happens. So is it possible, you think, to still push this idea of perfectionism without the negative connotations, or should it be pretty much a complete overhaul? And maybe we just move from that idea of being perfect at all, maybe call it something else, maybe, I don't know. I think for my students, I try to um, kind of rethink negativity and criticism. I feel like in a, we've grown up in a society where, you know, you start off like hardcore, be the best you can be, and we're hard on you for a reason and get tough and da 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 Then we went to this, this spot where it's like, can't ever tell the kids that they're wrong. You can't ever tell them that this isn't right, that they made a mistake because it'll break them down. And we have to constantly, you know, just in many ways, I, I want to say coddle in such a way that doesn't, doesn't um, uh, tear down, you know, the, the delicate mind frame that they have. Mm-hmm. Right. And I, so I think where I'm in, I'm in support of constructively criticizing um, a student in such a way though, but I think we need an overall as to, to how we do it so that they see it as a goal to better something that is already good and not as a goal to, to fix something that started off awful. Mm. And I also think we have to, um, like I, I always say to them, you guys, if I didn't have, if there was nothing for me to critique, I'd be out of a job. I say, you want to make sure that there are things the teacher sees in you that you can that you need to fix because then they see that as a sign of potential for you to get better and to improve. I always say mistakes are a great thing. Doing things wrong are a wonderful thing because it's an opportunity for you to learn how to do something differently so that that move that you do, you do then do successfully. So I, I think we have to, number one, change how we approach the constructive criticism, but also number two, change within our own society, within our kids, telling them it's good to be quote unquote bad at something, or it's good to be quote unquote, not at a level yet where you want to be, where you have to face what, like, you know, I don't don't ever want to look at myself trying to do an adagio because God, I look awful. But we have to change how we look at that and say, yeah, I'm excited to see where I can get better. And we have to change it to instead of, you know, to say that instead of saying, I'm excited to see where I was so god awful. You know, I think that's where weakness comes from because no one wants to look at themselves. They're afraid to look at themselves and, and see something horrible. But there's that strength of looking at yourself and seeing like, oh, yeah, look at that. OK, that's what I'm going to work on next. Yeah, let's go. Like we have to change that or in order for kids to approach it differently. That's why. Mm-hmm. I don't know where it's going, but that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree with that. I think that what what is also seems like is lost is that that strive to that next level is missing. Like, you know, like you were saying that it's okay to not be good at something, but then it feels like we have a, a, a generation of students that that's where they were left off. Well, it's okay that I'm mm. not good at that it's okay if I can't get it. It's okay. But you know, it's like, you're right. It is okay. And no one is saying that it's not okay. However, let's also think about where you can get to. And I think that push to be better um, is, is really that perfection, right? Like that's really, Mm -hmm. I, in my mind, when I think of wanting my students to be perfect, I know that whenever and I, and I had to learn this. My, I remember at the night before my very first dance competition with a new team, I, I uh, text my high school director and I was like, I am super nervous. Like, I don't know if they're ready. I don't know if I'm ready. And she was like, at this point, there's really nothing you can do now. She's like, you know, they could practice in, in practice and they could rehearse and it could be perfect before you left and then go out on that dance floor and it could be the worst thing you've ever seen. And you're just like, well, that that's weird. Like I thought, I thought we had that perfect. So it's one of those things where I know that that perfection is, is only, only to their ability in that, in that moment, right? Um, in that moment of rehearsal, in that moment of performance. And so 
I want them to strive to be that. But I think that sometimes there's a disconnect on that in between, like where maybe they don't know how to get there. And like, that's where they get frustrated because they can't visually see how, how they're going to get better. And that's where it just takes work. You know, it just takes the, the fact that they have to want to, um, they have to want to want it. I think it's interesting what you said too, because it, it made me go back to something my mother would always tell me, which is like, well, maybe that's just the best that they can do. Mm-hmm. And sometimes as a teacher, you know, you have to stop and look because sometimes your demand, like you're just so frustrated that they just can't, why have we not fixed this? Why have we not gotten this? And then sometimes I myself have had to step back and look and like really look at the, the student and say, and look and be like, okay, she's trying her hardest like she's she's trying she's putting put forth you know she's putting forth as much as she can and as much as she can understand and I can see her body is fighting against what her brain gets but her muscles don't get it yet and in some ways like that goes back to okay you did your best Mm -hmm. and you want them to strive for more but at the same time you as a teacher sometimes have to settle because you can see that that's what they can do right now. Mm-hmm. But I think where we've gotten to sometimes, like you said, at a point is that's okay. And yes, it is okay. But at the same time, we still have to then go back to that same kid in a month and a year or however much later and be like, right. all right, now let's keep going. You right. know, it's, it's that balance. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I think I've had some students that are like, you know, it's so f- they will, they will try to impress or, or say like, oh, well, I, I, did a, I did a double pirouette. And I'm like, well, you did, but your foot wasn't in passe. And they're like, can I just get credit for it? And I'm just like, I mean. <laughs> Do you want credit for that? Mean? Well, I mean, you know, I, you know, I got around twice. I'm just yeah. like, okay, but okay. it wasn't. <laughs> I can put a treat in front of my dog and she'll get around twice. You know, like. Right. <laughs> Like very, very much because that that was actually the next slide. Um, So being trained to see flaws first, and this is, of course, specifying dancers. But I learned that as a musician and the way I teach is how I was taught that I'm like, okay, well, I'm telling you what to fix. And I think it ties back into that idea of, okay. If I genuinely care, and if I genuinely am like, yes, I see potential here, you can go so much further. Me just telling you everything that's already good is not benefiting you. Right. Now, how we go about telling them the things that need to be fixed, maybe that's the part where it gets sketchy sometimes. And I will admit too that I forget to tell my kids the good stuff. I would say that that is also, you know, like that is where we could be better in that quote that I read. I made me like, it made me sit back and be like, how many times I actually tell them they did a good job. (laughs) When I tell you, like my kids will always be like, "Mm, I don't trust it. You never (laughs) say stuff like that. I'm like, look, you better take this compliment. (laughs) Let, let me compliment you because this was work. And so like towards my um, end of teaching in the school system, it was a very conscious effort to say, okay, that was better or Mm -hmm. that was good. Okay. So now let's look at X, Y, Z. And to be honest, I don't think it helped. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Well, let me, let me rephrase that. It helped with their, um, I guess, Fred fragility. That's the best way I'm gonna put that. Uh, that's all I got. However, did it help push them to actually strive for better? No. When I was quote unquote mean and only giving the corrections, that's when they would push. Now, to be fair, I would push all the way up until performance. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yeah, you're getting nothing out of me until we see what this does on stage. Because like you said, they're like, it could be perfect in rehearsal and they can get on that stage and they'd be like, oh my God, did I teach you anything? Oh my God, what was that? So I'm like, until I see it on stage, 
there's always work to be done. And even past that, but you know, I try to give them at least some type of attainable goal. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember I had one group. They were great. Those are my babies. They were funny. They, um, I liked that piece. I still do. I can look at a recording of it and be like, was it perfect? No. Did they do the best that they could? Yes. Did they push in all the places that I told them they needed to? Yes. Mm -hmm. And so when they came off stage, I'm like tears and smiling and they're crying now because I was like, she's happy. (laughs) We did it. And I'm like, that sounds insane. And I fully acknowledge it. However, they had a sense of accomplishment. Mm -hmm. And that to me was more important than it being perfect. But I don't tell them that because I'm like, I don't, I don't want you to think that the end goal is, oh, I did the best I could. <sighs> it's like, no, do better. I'm like, okay, that was the best you could do today. Yeah. What, what are you doing tomorrow? What are you doing next week? A month, a year from now? Like, what are you doing to keep growing? And some stuff, it's like, you know, you'll just never be great at. And that's okay. But that doesn't mean you stop trying to be. And I think that for me is the disconnect that I personally don't think they're more fragile than we were. I don't think so, but folks be saying it. So I'm like, we weren't, but we weren't participation trophy kids. We were not. It was like, Oh, you lost. Mm. Right. Better luck next time. Maybe work harder, maybe practice a little longer, but what you didn't get was first. And I was very much child. Let me tell you, very much raised on the, if you didn't get first, you were last. It doesn't matter. Anything short of first place is you didn't win. <laughs> it's just like silver. No, don't count. No, it's like, it doesn't count. You didn't win. Yeah. You didn't. And was it frustrating? Yes. But that frustration for the majority of us was like, okay, what do I need to do to fix it? What do I need to do to make sure the next time I walk away, I'm the one walking away with first. What do I need to do to do that? Right. And then we work on it. So I, I'm just like, okay, well, where did that disconnect happen? You know what? Because it I, I some of our they, people I who wonder they're afraid. I wonder if they're afraid of success. You know what I it, mean? Like, mm, or if there's like a fear no, of, fear, I of think that's part. fear of accomplishment or fear of like, you know, or, or the fear of accomplishment, but then on the other side, fear of disappointment, right? Like what happens when you try really, really hard and you, and you give it, you're 100% and you still come up short. Like, what does that mean about, what does that say about you? You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. it's easy to like, kind of not care. And then also get, you know, get second and I'm like, okay, well, you know, I guess maybe if I had tried, I probably would have gotten first. But you mm-hmm. know, but it's one of those like, well, you'll never know because you didn't try your best. Yeah. And if you get first and you just didn't try, you're like, well, I guess I might be, you know, might be pretty good or everybody else was terrible because I didn't even try my best and I got first. So, yeah. um, you know, I don't know. And, and, and I, that's my assumption, you know, maybe these kids are out here like giving it 101% and it's I don't think like they are. Really, <laughs> that's not you, nice. You know, yeah. Right, exactly. Exactly. I don't, I don't Some know. of them might be. Some of them yeah. might be. Let me not be pessimistic. But I, I think, I think you're right. I think a part of it is a fear of success. Um, because if I, whether I'm trying my hardest or not, if I fail, then it's like, well, I got somewhere else to go from here. So hmm, it'll, it'll be fine. It'll work out. But if I succeed, it's like, oh, well, the bar is here now. Mm-hmm. what 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 do I do <laughs> like what do I do I, do I, I got to keep doing this yeah. and now that is a thing I've seen in students where it was like okay we like we got top scores great so what do we do now and I'm like oh now you have to maintain and yeah. they're like oh but that's that's hard though yeah. and in some cases that maintenance is harder and I'm like yeah sorry but um Mm-hmm. I don't I don't know what to tell you at that point. Like, yes, 
Either you're working to achieve or you're working to maintain. Either way, you're working, though. So right. it's going to wrap your head around the fact that you got to work. Yeah. But, bless, I mean, precious lambs. Precious lambs. <laughs> I don't be understand. And again, it's, it's people, I would say, our generation – maybe some in the one right before us that, that brought up these. So some of the times I'm like, well, I'd be one to say what's going on with your parents, but your parents are like around my age. And I'm just like, I got some memos that they clearly didn't get, or they are rebelling against having received because I mean, it wasn't easy. It's not, uh, some people make it look easy. Mm -hmm. Some people make doing the work look easy. Yeah. And even though you can tell they're working, they still don't really let on how much of a struggle it is, but it is right. um, always being expected to be the straight A student to always be the top performer, to always be the best athlete. Like always being expected to be the best is draining and stressful. But many people who do it, do it in such a way that you can look at it and be like, oh, well, that's just for them. Like, because like, it's easy for them. It's like, no, they, they, they go through it. So then you take those people and those people have kids mm. and it's like one or two things more than likely is going to happen. There may be some gray area, but either they're going to raise their kids the same way or, or they're going to say, I hated that. Mm -hmm. And I will I'm never do to that do to my kids. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I said, I would be that parent that would be like, I'm not going to do this to them. And let me tell you who does it to them. <laughs> Cause I'm like, what you're not going to do in this house though is be felon. That's what we're not doing. So that's where that gray area I think exists. Maybe mm -hmm. I won't, I don't get on them for not having straight A's. Mm -hmm. I've been wanting to, but I, I don't do it because mm -hmm. I, I remember how that felt. <laughs> I remember, Oh, Oh, there was that one time I just had one B and it was like, I had failed all my classes <laughs> and it was the worst. <laughs> and so I was like, all right, you know what, what I'm not going to do is put them through that. Yeah. But anything lower than a B, we have a problem. <laughs> so the same, raised the same way. And I don't think that's anything, anything wrong with that. You know, I, I don't like where we've gotten where it's like, Okay, but your kid got a C because they didn't do this and they didn't yes. do that. And it is not my fault, nor is it my responsibility as the teacher to change that. Yeah, because I'm not. Because your kid didn't do what they were supposed to do. So, I mean, it's one thing if they got that C and that was literally the best that they had to offer. Right. More than likely, though. It was not. And it that's, that's a not. you problem. That's a you and your child problem. Right. That's a you and your child problem. That is not a me problem. You did not. Well, I, what did I pay money for tuition for? To For me to give your kid an education and experience and life, not to coddle your damn child through co like, college. Like, I didn't. Oh, my God. Because let me tell you, college, they're like that, too. And I'm like, y'all just be like this for real? How y'all get this far? Who did this? And then I'm like, but... You see it on the high school level. You see it on the middle school level. You definitely see it elementary. And it's just like, why would you? Mm -hmm. yeah. Who are you working for that does that for their employees? Because I haven't yeah. worked a job like that, like ever. Right. And I'm just like, who's out here doing that? Because I'm trying and to prepare. It, 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 and it's the exact opposite now when we live in a world where time is money, money is time. Mm -hmm. No, 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 this not, that's not going to work for you in the real world. Like, you just set these kids up for And that's not to say there aren't yeah. teachers who are out here not doing what they're supposed to do. Of course. Every job got people who not doing what they're supposed to do. Right. But let's be real. Usually, the case is that the parent wants the child coddled. 
And then for us, child, I will never get over the bitterness of being told, well, it's just dance. I'm like, well, they just failed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Call call me in on a meeting on that, and I I will repeat it. I'll write it down for you. I'll take the notes. I will have a picture of myself holding said notes and frame mm-hmm. it for you. But if it's just dance, then they just fail, and it's just on their transcript. <laughs> so either you talk to your child about what they need to do in order to perform better in this course, mm-hmm. or don't at me. Either way is good. Either way. I will show up and instruct the way that I know I should. Right. Amen. But like that coddling thing, I think is part of the reason we're kind of in this place where, again, not saying how perfectionism was taught to us was necessarily the best way, Mm -hmm. but I can see how that shift in mentality of, oh, my baby is the greatest. My baby is perfect. I don't want nothing to hurt my baby. Mm -hmm. I can see how that could have an impact on perfectionism. A very damaging one. Yes. Mm -hmm. That I understand. Um, Yeah. I still think we should aim for perfectionism. (laughs) I need to work on that, though. (laughs) I just personally need to do better because that's just me. Um, But I will say I don't, for the level of, for students and even for my own kids, I want them to aim for it with the expectation that even if you miss, you're going to be pretty excellent because you were aiming for it. So I'm not mad at it when you miss the perfection. It's just like, okay, well, you missed this. What are some things we can work on? All right, cool you were still great. Like you did a great job. Yeah. Now this is what we can do moving forward. That don't apply to me personally though. I I think that ties back though to what we said is our shortcoming falls from, we aim for perfection in our children, but at the same time we want to like reward them. I hate saying for mediocrity. I don't want to say that, but reward them for not, for, for not really doing what they needed to do to work towards that perfection. Like where we, I feel like when we start to reward the kids for mediocre effort, Mm -hmm. not maybe mediocre performance, but mediocre effort, which is where we've gotten to, then that's where we get to like, what you were talking about with the girl who's like, well, I went around twice. And it's like, okay, but it's the quality of how you got around that matters more than you just getting around. And that's where I feel like we've gotten into trouble with our kids it's like we have two completely differing ends of the spectrum, you know? Well, I think, yeah. yeah. And I think we're, we're in that trouble. We're definitely in that trouble with education. And what's sad is that there are some, some schools, some teachers that aren't doing that for their students. And like the, like communities are supporting that. And those are the students that are performing probably better on these standardized tests. They're performing better at a post post-secondary because they, they've been a part of a community that is not going to say, you know, well, they turned it in. It's right here. They turned it in. Who cares that it was due two months ago? It's right here. Take it and grade it for them. You know, and it's, and it's you know, those types of instances that I think I feel like, admin- I mean, I feel like administrators should see this, uh, but I feel like parents do not see how that greatly affects the way their child will function pretty much for the rest of their lives. And, and it's, and it's a life skill that I think um, parents should start to teach their children, um, especially by the time they're in middle school, for sure when they're in high school. Mm -hmm. And I wish if I were a college professor, I wish a parent would call me. <laughs> right? Right? I wish a parent, hi, I'm calling, I'm the parent of Click. Yes. <laughs> I feel like, mm, <laughs> I am not required to speak to you. Yeah. Mm-mm. Exactly. No, 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 no. Sometimes I wish I could do that for some of these high schools, like especially these high school seniors. Hi. I'm the parent of 
click? No. Your, I see your child, I, and, I, and I worked in a community like this where I had a student who would, in my face, be like, I'm fine, things are good, you know, I'm, and I'm just trying to coach her through how to be a better leader, how to be a better cheerleader. And she'd be like, yes, I get it, I get it, I get it. After practice, my phone's ringing, it's her dad. Hey, she came home and she was talking about X, Y, and Z, and she's really, I'm like, well, I just talked to her today. And we had this conversation. So I don't know why I'm getting another phone call from, uh, why am I getting a call from you to rediscuss this, this issue? Like, I think that's where parents think, well, I'm just protecting my child. And it's like, you are hurting your child. And you are, I think maybe some of these parents are like, well, I just need, I just need to be needed. I need these, I need these mm. kids that need me for beyond. And it's like, mm. okay, you can do that. But then they're just going to be just poor functioning adults mm -hmm. in the world. Facts. And like, I've I had like that. I moments. need to be needed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, and I've had moments. I'm not going to lie. Like the baby just turned double digits. Yeah. And I'm just like, so do you need me for anything? Or <laughs> like, I'm good. <laughs> like, <laughs> I need you to need me though. But then also I can be like, hmm. I'm pretty sure come like end of middle school, high school, I'm like, I'm gonna need you to need me a little bit less. <laughs> <laughs> I need you to be able to work through some things by yourself. Yeah. And like, like with the oldest, um, there've been many instances dealing with him where it has been a very, like I've stopped myself and have told him, I'm like, you need to email that teacher. You need to ask that question. If y'all can't work it out, let me know then. If, if, if you just can't, like if they refuse the answer, let me know that. Or if you don't understand something, let me know that. I'll help you draft the email. I'll check it over for you. But you got to handle this. Like you're old now. <laughs> like you got to be able to do it. And even the princess, like middle school, I'm like, mm, you know, you talk to your teacher about that. Like that was on you. You made a piss poor decision. Talk yeah. to them. See if they'll work with you. And for example, she did not do that. And so now she's about to deal with these hair consequences. And I'm like, oh man, sucks for you. But what I wasn't about to do is jump in that. Cause I'm like, mm -mm. Yeah. you got to learn how to do this yourself because yeah. there's going to come a day where I won't be able to step in like that. And mm -hmm. If all you know is to call mom, what are you going to do when you can't call me? Right. Or what are you going to do when you expect, well, I, I did what you said. Like I went and talked to the teacher. I emailed them. I this and that, but they still didn't change their mind. Okay. They didn't change their mind. Th that might be the consequence of what your action is. It's not sure. the parents then responsibility to go up and be like, okay, well, they did what they were supposed to, so now you need to fix it. No, yeah, not, at all. not at all. Not and at all. Like, what's always fun to me, no. and I, like, I've always said it to my kids, I've said it to like, their teachers, I'm like, I teach. So whether that is to their advantage or disadvantage, I'm like, oh, no, I see this a little different because I wish a parent would. Mm -hmm. So what I'm not going to do is turn around and do the same thing I hate having done to me and do it to somebody else. Yeah. Um, I think... Maybe once this year I did get into it with a teacher. <laughs> it was wild. We ended up having a whole meeting and then we were cool after that. But <laughs> I admit I was wrong for a good chunk of that. I, I can admit it. <laughs> it was very much a like protect the child. And then talking, I was like, wait a minute, my child be tripping. I'm so sorry. You right. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> what do we need to do? I got you. <laughs> Call me if you need me. Snatch her if you need to. Do what you got to do. I'm sorry. That was my fault. So, <laughs> and I'm like, there's not enough parents, I think, who are recognize that. Willing, yeah. to, willing to even recognize it. They'd be like, <laughs> you know what? You're the expert in this field. Yeah. And I'm like, let's just pause on that sentence. Yeah. Like in this room, I'm the expert. Right. Right. I'm like, you know, I, I've only gone to school for it. I only have the degrees in it. I'm only certified to teach it. I'm just doing what I was brought here to do. Let me do that. 
Yeah. If I, unless I'm telling your child something that will cause them harm, right. trust me. And a lot of the time, what I liked about high school, but also was stressful to like my higher ups is I'm like, I don't be calling home. But I was like, for what? You're closer to adulthood than anything else. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna help you figure this out. And like you said, like I, I will talk them through it, but like, okay, this is another thing you can try. Okay, you can do this. Okay, well, if you've tried this and this didn't work, okay, let's look at it from this way. Like, let's work it out. Let's figure out how to troubleshoot it. And to still fool around, get a phone call from a parent. It's like, well, I just want to know why. I want to know why you're talking to me because <laughs> talk to the kid already. We're working it out. They're fine. Talk to them though. Like, don't talk to me. Like, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. In fact, I'm doing above and beyond what I'm supposed to be doing. So, yeah. don't yeah. talk to me. Yeah, yeah. I don't get that. I don't call parents either. I mean, me unless, unless unless it's like a really strong circumstance or like something mm-hmm. that I know maybe I should, but like I just feel like that's where our, that's where our education system just f's over these kids when we just put so much emphasis on well the teacher needs to have a lot of like mandating a lot of parent contact now mm-hmm. granted i like i had a i had a student who was not dressing out um or was like really like wishy-washy with her dressing out some days she would some days she wouldn't then she go a couple of days where she wouldn't. And of course, you know, we're on block schedule. So going a couple of days is like going a week where you don't dress out. Uh, and so her grade was low. And so mom called for a, for a, a, a conference. And in the conference, she said, well, why didn't you call me and tell me that she wasn't dressing out and let me know that she wasn't dressing out. And I'm just thinking, she knows what the rule, like she knows exactly what she's doing. Like, this is not a, like, I need to call mom and say, hey, she's not dressing out. She knows exactly mm-hmm. what the expectation is. She knows exactly what it is that she needs to do. So, and granted, I, I understand that, like, mom being, like, or, or parent being at home is, like, an extra, is an extra set of eyes. It's an extra voice. It's an extra voice of reasoning just to kind of say, hey, you need to do this if, if you're not doing this. You know, if you're not doing X, you know, then then this is going to happen. Um, but I also just feel like, how closely are you monitoring or watching your child or know or knowing what your child is doing? You know, mm-hmm. like if I know that my child is in dance and I see my child every morning before they leave, or whatever the case, like I'm just like, do you have dance today? Do you did you bring your clothes? Did you pack everything? Like I grew up in a very, in a single parent home, but like, you know, my mom would, would, I'd be finished homework by time she'd get off work, but I still had like a check-in. Like, did you do this? Did you make sure you got, get this done? You know, also that was a time to like, you know, hand over, like sign this paper where it's like, you know, I understand that, that in some situations, like sometimes communicating with, with parents through maybe a phone call, maybe an email, maybe like something written, you know, that may not always connect with the parent in a way, depending on what they have going on. It may not connect with them in a way that's like, man, I should really, I should really do something about this or I should really kind of handle this. Um, but I, I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't say zero parent communication is, is, is good because I have had some really good instances where like calling the parent or emailing the parent was like nip that in the bud real quick. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also think that there are some issues that the kid just has to kind of learn that you yeah. can push the envelope probably because you put like the, how you push the envelope at home, but it ain't going to work out in your favor. Your parent ain't giving you a grade. Mm-mm, not at all. I'd be like, I'm not your mama. Yeah. So whatever be working with her, mm, you know, be blessed. Right. But yeah, I, I want, I wouldn't call over them not dressing. And I definitely got that in conferences before. Well, why didn't you call me? Because that wasn't major enough for me to call you. They, they know the expectations. It was on the syllabus that you signed and they returned. So if they call me out my name, I'm going to call you. If they get into a fight, I'm going to call you. If they are just sitting in the corner every class period, refusing to do anything, I might call you. 
But if for the most part they're participating and they just refuse to dress, they know they're losing those points. And I, I can guarantee you I've spoken to them. I can guarantee you that. I will. I think that's something that needs to be part of like a syllabus of like mm-hmm. for parents to see like when when would I call you? Like I mm. would call you for this list of in, for, of instances, but yeah. no that it is up to your child to know these things. Like if they are failing, see, pardon me, it's like if they're failing a class, I don't want to call your parent. They know why they're failing. Like that, that's not a like, now if they failed, if they fail, let's say they failed a re- progress report and it's report card time and they're still failing, maybe then I'd be like, let's have a conversation with your parent because now I see that maybe someone's not really monitoring you mm. that well that they're letting you continue to still fail. But other than that, like, no, I'm not. mm -mm. No, I don't think it's necessary. It's not. It's not. I'm like, just, and for the littles, you know what? I'm about to lie to you. Cause no, the kid that's in elementary, I'll be like, don't y'all call me if he ain't change out. Say something to him because he's past kindergarten now. Okay. I'll give you, K through two, I'll give you that. Around eight, they're doing it on purpose. Yeah. <laughs> Say something to that kid, penalize them. Mm, sorry. <laughs> it is yeah. what it is. And I am this parent because my parents were these parents that when they say like, well, Miss So-and-so did X, Y, Z to me. I'm like, what'd you do? Mm-hmm. Or what did you not do that you were supposed to? Yeah. What was your role in this <laughs> before yeah. I talked to them? And like the, oh, oh man, I don't know if I should admit to this. <laughs> uh-huh. Man, that Otis caught it. It was seventh or eighth grade. Oh, it was eighth grade. Child, I asked, I was like, I need you to tell me what happened because they called me before I go in there. I need you to tell me. And then he came up with his reason. I was like, are you sure this is the story you want to stick with? You're positive because this is what I'm going to go. I'm going to repeat it back. Like you're going to be in there with me and I'm going to repeat it back verbatim to this teacher. And he said, yeah. So I went in there, I repeated it back. And when I tell you, that teacher laid all the things out. I looked at him, looked at the teacher. Teacher was like, you want me to step out for a minute because <laughs> I know you work for the system. <laughs> I can leave the room. <laughs> I'll give you like five minutes. <laughs> I- I'll be back. Let me tell you. School property. It was fine. He lived. He's still alive. <laughs> He's going to graduate this year. But like no he yeah. was old enough to yeah. know he made that decision consciously and that same kid fifth grade similar situation I'm like, you're old enough yeah. so i don't understand the onus being put on the teachers all the time again the little bitties I think maybe more communication that makes sense because they're small. They don't really know right from left. They don't, yeah. you're just praying that they don't hurt themselves or others at that point. Fine. Right. But around age eight, you need to start giving a little bit more credit to these kids. I'm like, kids aren't dumb. Like they're really smart and they know when they can push a boundary shit they know when they can't and they'll still do it because they're like well i know this is gonna go bad but i want to know how bad it'll go yeah. let's try and find out and it's like if you always swoop in and save them you are setting them up to someday decide that they're going to push an envelope that's going to blow up in their face yeah and i'm like because i think you said it earlier daryl i think you did that the sooner you start with it, and of course you're not going to give an eight-year-old the amount of responsibility you'll give an 18-year-old. Of course yeah. not. Yeah. But the sooner you start with that idea and just get them accustomed to it, mm-hmm. the better off they'll be, period. Just yeah. as people. Right. 
Man, I'm thinking back to that conference. Child, that boy almost lost his life that day. Mm-hmm. Embarrassing me. Mm. <laughs> I tell you, kids be out here tripping. That's why I don't be calling home. I'm like, nah, man, I got my own kids. Yeah. I know how y'all do. Yeah. I was a kid before. I know how y'all do. You can handle this. So, handle it. Right. So, we've covered a lot of the things that were on these slides, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> um, one more that I wanted to touch on before we go is, and I love this one because I say it all the time, is a dancer's body is their instrument. Now, the downside to that for dancers is the, uh, well, let's say the upkeep and care of said body and dealing with expectations that are potentially unrealistic. Um that may be set on ideal body structures that not everyone falls under, Mm -hmm. um, that are built on assumptions of what your body can and cannot, should, should not be able to do. Mm -hmm. Um, So one of the things they bring up is how many dancers um, hold strict diets and even self-medicate in order to keep their bodies at an optimal appearance. Mm. And I think, you know what, for me, comparing to a literal instrument, if my trombone looks shiny, but the slide still has dents in it, I can't play it. It's not gonna work. I have to make sure all the inner workings are up to par. So the outside may not be all pretty new shiny, like one that was just purchased, but everything works the way it's supposed to. And it produces what I I needed to produce. Mm -hmm. And I think the same applies to the body Mm -hmm. that there is like, again, going back to undergrad and that one teacher the focus was on this is what the body should look like. It wasn't on, okay, well, this is how the body should move. This is how the body should operate. This is how you take care of the body. It was like, it should look like this. And so that focus was on appearance only Mm -hmm. instead of internal. So perfection in that realm, I think is fine if the focus is on how the body should work as opposed to just how the body should look. Like, I don't care if you want to perfect healthy eating. I don't care if you want to perfect how to properly do a warm up. Do all those things, please. But you should not be focused on, okay, well, I have to be this size and I have to look exactly like this other person who you ain't got the same body type as them. You're not as tall. You're just not built that way. So So what what? are you about to do to yourself to try to fit this perfect appearance? Right. I think it also, it's interesting because that we could have like a three days long conversation about that because there's so much that ties into but I think what you, the heart of it, which I think has plagued the dance community, is that it has to look a certain way, is the in order for it to move a certain way, and that's mm-hmm. it. There's no give and take, and it's not going to move a certain way unless we say it looks a certain way. And I think the reason why that's so nuanced, because that, in my opinion, ties so much into race mm-hmm. within the dance community, because you, if you as a woman of color or if you as a, a curvy girl, you don't look that certain way, there's that automatic, no ifs, ands, or buts about it, you can't move that certain way. And I think it hasn't been until recently, like with the Misty's, because Misty, even at 13, you know, she was 
Mm-hmm. She had, she did not have the, does not have the typical ballerina body, even though she's skinny. She's so muscular and built and she's cur- like, she's got boobs and she's curvy and all of that. Mm-hmm. But she can, mm-hmm. you, you know, we're slowly changing that, that narrative. And I think what that narrative is also damaging for people who do not have that body, because then they say to themselves, well, I don't have that body to begin with. So I, there's no really point in me trying to strive for perfection in the quality of my work, because they've already told me I can't just because of the way I'm built to begin with. So I'm just going to settle for doing it okay and hope that passes. So I, I it's so like that last thing just connects to so many mm-hmm. things in a in a problematic way that I think we it's slow I'm starting to see it change a little bit but we could still do work Mm -hmm. to to make it more accessible yeah I agree I think that that um I agree with the the race and racism really just kind of in dance and the and the discrimination for um for the different body types and um, yeah, and I think I, I feel like I've seen so many different, um, seen and been a part of so many different groups that, you know, perfecting the body is sometimes in, un- in unhealthy ways, um, can be very damaging to people, mm-hmm. um, you know, physically and mentally. Um, I even sometimes think that like, and not even think I know, I know I even have some body issues just because I can think back to being in college and dancing and dancing ev- like every day um, and still looking at myself thinking, oh my God, I am, I need to lose weight. Like I am. Uh, All day, know, every day still. So, so much <laughs> and, and then, and then, and then sitting back now looking at those pictures then and just thinking, how did I ever think that, mm. you know, like that I was, I, I thought I was, overweight um when it could have just been that i was just more muscular at that point and gaining more muscle and so because the scale said i was a certain size and you know i wasn't the size of some of these other people that i was dancing alongside i just thought oh this is this is not right like what's going on and so um no i definitely and, and my weight also just struggled like kind of roller coasters too like over the years but no i definitely think that um, it's all about perfecting, wanting to pre- perfect your healthy eating, healthy warm-ups, healthy exercising, mm-hmm. but not exercising to a point where you're trying to achieve something that is unrealistic. So, yeah. Agreed on all accounts. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. All right, my loves. Thank you you're for a great welcome. conversation per usual. Yeah. Um, because like you said, Marie, we could talk about this for days, yeah. especially. And I got to take her out because she having a conniption over here. Thinking <laughs> oh. trying to storm the <laughs> Look, she's like, I, let me tell you how surprised like, I am. Yeah. My little puppy is actually being quiet and I'm thankful. So before I talk him up, <laughs> before we go there, thank you all for joining us again here at Dance Talk Realness. Uh, make sure that you like, comment, follow, subscribe, anywhere you can find us, Facebook. Instagram, YouTube, Apple Podcasts. I would just also, before you leave, I uh, just want to point out, there'll be a moment when you watch this in which I did like this. It was a fruit fly in my face. And I was not doing that to you because you had started talking and then I started swatting. And I just want to make it clear to everybody out there, I get fly. Hilarious. Okay. Let, let's talk about how it just won't be edited out. It's fine. Yeah, It's all right. Fine. Yeah. The realness. That's what we talk about here. <laughs> if you have any questions or comments for our lovely guest, Marie, or for me and Daryl, any of our past guests, um, be sure to drop us a line in the comments under Instagram or YouTube and let us know. We'll be sure to answer them and we look forward to bringing some fresh new content next week. See you then. Bye.